Hello, my name is Jordan and I would like to discuss fashion during the Baroque period. Afra Ben was a very prolific writer in the 17th century who didn't stick to just one genre. She was famous for poetry, playwriting, translating, and even works of fiction. She was one of the first women to earn her living entirely by her writing, and as such she paved the way for many women who came after her. She was a staunch supporter of the Stuart lineage of English royalty, so when William III took the throne and she was invited by the bishop to write a welcoming poem for him, she politely declined. In spite of this, she was still revered to the extent that she was buried in Westminster Abbey upon her death. While Bain wrote many pieces that were entirely of her own imagining, the Rover, also known as the Banished Cavaliers, is a revision of Thomas Killigrew's The Wanderer. Set in 1677 in the Kingdom of Naples, the rover tells the story of a group of English men and women who have traveled to the Kingdom of Naples to enjoy Carnival, which was sort of a let's have a great time before Lent starts and everybody's giving up something and being very somber. Italy during the Restoration was very different from what we know today. The Kingdom of Naples, the boot portion of the country you see in yellow, was ruled by King Charles II of Spain. While this area was hotly contested for hundreds of years between countries such as France, Spain, and even Hungary, during the time that the play is set, control was in Spanish hands. In addition to all the fighting for control of the Kingdom of Naples, there were other ways in which it was a very turbulent time. The Black Plague appeared several times during this period and killed off significant portions of the population. Meanwhile, the citizens of the Kingdom of Naples became increasingly unhappy with the heavy taxes which were levied on them by Spain. If you look at the edges of the map, you can see North Africa to the southwest, France to the northwest, Germany to the north, and Greece and the Balkans to the northeast. Since power in Italy was neither unified nor centralized during this time, it seems as though everybody wanted a piece of it. From 1555 to 1714, the Kingdom of Naples was part of the Spanish Empire. There was an uprising in 1647 over taxation, which was suppressed in 1648. This is an excellent example of how the lower and middle classes were treated by the rulers. The borders existing during the time period of the play were established by the Treaty of London. Spain at this time was ruled by Charles II, not to be confused with Charles II of England. He was the son of King Philip III of Spain and Marlena of Austria, and was the last member of the Habsburg dynasty as he died without an heir. England at this time was ruled by King Charles II, who was known as the Merry King. While he was highly popular with his people, he unfortunately was pretty inept at being a monarch and especially bad at foreign policy. He had at least 13 mistresses and fathered many illegitimate children. However, he did not have a legitimate heir. France at this time was ruled by King Louis XIV, who holds the record as the longest reigning sovereign monarch. While he liked to portray the image of health and prosperity, this wasn't necessarily the case. Evidence suggests that he might have suffered from a myriad conditions, including diabetes and gout. You can see from the portraits that I've shown of various monarchs what the very wealthy and ruling class was wearing. But what did the everyday people wear? The garments worn by women showed many similarities between social class. The main differences were in the quantity and quality of fabric used to make the garments. Just as today, Foundation garments are extremely important for the structure of an overall outfit. Women started with the chemise, the sleeves of which you can see on the left, which looked something like a nightgown. Then they would put on stockings, which were gartered just below the knee using either a ribbon or leather garter. Here is where the order of steps becomes pretty darn crucial. The shoes must come next. Once you put on the stays, which are the piece that follows the shoes, you can't put anything else on that requires bending over. After the shoes come several layers of petticoats. An impoverished woman might only have one or two petticoats and wear one during the summer and two or three during the winter to keep warm. However, a wealthy woman might have as many as six or seven. The very last petticoat, which is not shown in this picture, would go on the outside of the stays. 
It's important to note that the stays are different from a corset. They are much more of a support garment and less intending to constrain the waist, thus creating a greater range of motion. Although you still want to put your shoes on first because it's going to be a pain. In examining these three portraits from the time period, one can notice several similarities in the style of dress worn by the upper crust of society. First, please examine the neckline. It shows a great deal of bosom, although a more modest woman would put a kerchief underneath her dress to cover more of her shoulders. Next, let's examine the sleeves. The frills and lace would be part of the chemise, which is showing from underneath. You can see that a great deal of yardage was required to create the very, very, very puffy sleeves that were popular at this time. Examining the bodice of the red and gold gown on the left, one can see that the bodice comes to a very decided point in a strategically placed location. These women would be wearing many, many petticoats, which would give them quite a full skirt, creating a very small-waisted silhouette. While the outer garments worn by men during this time were quite fanciful, the undergarments were quite simple. The bottom undergarment was known as drawers and would frequently close with a drawstring tie. The shirt, which was quite long, had a very simple collar which would be covered by a cravat. As you can see from these images, women certainly did not have a monopoly on the puffy sleeves. Men started by putting on their drawers and shirt and tied the sleeves of the shirt with a ribbon which was usually red. Stockings were, like the women's, gartered at the knee, where they would meet the tight-fitting breeches that were very popular during this time. The cravat was tied with a ribbon at the neck, creating a cascade of lace from the clavicle, sometimes all the way down to mid-chest. Over the shirt and breeches would be worn a very long waistcoat, which may or may not have had sleeves. This garment would often be made of contrasting fabric, as you can see in the left-hand image in blue, and it would be made of a very nice fabric, although the back might not be, simply because the coat would be covering it. As you can see in the picture on the right, the coat was also quite long, although the sleeves did not extend all the way down to the wrist, they often stopped at or just below the elbow. Children's clothing during the Restoration was not simply a smaller copy of what was worn by adults. Young boys would wear dresses until they were somewhere between two and eight years old, at which point they would experience what was known as breaching, and they would be switched to wearing clothes much more similar to what older men would wear. As a result, in some portraits it can be difficult to determine whether a child is actually male or female, given that the clothing that they wore was so similar. Many historians have resorted to using jewelry and other accessories worn by the child to determine gender. In the painting on the right, which is a smaller section from a much larger work, we can see that the child is a boy because he's holding a boy's hat. The child behind him is also a boy, although he has already gone through breaching. In the portrait on the left, we can see that the child is wearing garments that are very similar in construction to the child on the right. However, we can see from the image that this child is female due to the cap that she is wearing, which is much more feminine than the cap of the young boy. In this YouTube video by Prior Attire, you will see how to dress as a 17th century woman. This outfit that she is going to put on is set more in the mid 17th century. However, many of the garments are still the same. As you can see in this garment, she has a bodice that is attached to a petticoat rather than as two separate pieces. And notice that she already has her shoes and stockings on prior to putting this garment on. Since women of limited means might not have access to many gowns, it was very important that the clothing that they did have be adjustable so that it could accommodate something like weight gain during pregnancy. With this particular garment, this bodice is intended to show. And recall that it is protected by the chemise underneath from sweat and body oil, and the chemise is a garment that could much more easily be cleaned. A more affluent or noble-bred woman 
might prefer to wear many petticoats underneath the skirt in order to create a broader hipped silhouette. As you can see, the bodice laces up the front and there is a stomacher which she will pick up in a moment and place in the middle so that there aren't any gaps. This is another instance in which the outfit can be adjusted depending on a person's current weight and body shape. Here I cut out a bunch of footage of her lacing the bodice. You're welcome. It's pretty fantastic that she was able to use an actual historical pattern to create the jacket. She mentions here that you need an apron to protect the skirt from dust and such when doing household chores. And then next she goes to put on a kerchief to protect her shoulders and cleavage from sunshine. And for modesty, of course. And this would also be another piece that could easily be washed instead of washing the gown itself. Due to the fascinating nature of the play, I have several pieces of inspiration. The mask on the left is one of the first things that came to my mind as we tend to think of masks associated with carnival and there are several instances in the play where people are being less than truthful. Thinking about this play, the quote that comes to my mind that isn't from within the play itself is a quote by Walter Scott, which goes something along the lines of, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And in thinking along those lines, I selected the image on the right, which is a shawl woven to look like a spider web. However, the image that I will be drawing upon most heavily is that in the center. It is a work by the artist M.C. Escher, and on the next slide, you'll be able to see it in greater detail. Here you can see greater detail of the lithograph print known as Relativity by the artist M.C. Escher. Escher was famous for creating works which included impossibilities. Take a moment to examine the staircases here, and you will see that they cannot be existing simultaneously. Many of Escher's works are like this, and I would strongly encourage anybody who is fascinated by this as I am to take a look at some of his other pieces. Thank you for your time and attention. Here are my references should you desire to look further into the concepts of Baroque fashion.